Hello and welcome back to my series of videos about all calculators. In a previous video I was talking about mechanical calculators and um, I mentioned this one. Um, I didn't want to spend an entire video on this one because there's plenty of them on the on YouTube already. This is the, the Curta calculator and I, I like it very much. It's just so compact, you know, it's so um, uh, incredible because all the technology into such a small volume here is really nice. I mean, you can do uh, basic addition, uh, multiplication if you turn this enough time. And this was used in the rally uh, when the, there was a co pilot who had to do a lot of calculation very quickly during the 50s. So let's say that this one was. Uh, early 50s, uh, 1950, and uh, what I wanted to talk today about is about 18 years later, something like this. So, if you if you know a little bit about calculators, you will recognize this one. This is the uh, HP 9100. A. Uh, this was one of the first calculator that was compact in a way that you can put that on your desk and do a lot of calculation, very complicated calculation, and you didn't need a mainframe. So this is from 1968, and this is an A model. Um, there was a model B coming later, but this was this one is an A. Um, when it came in 1968, uh, it wasn't cheap. It was something like uh, $4,900, almost $5,000. So you say, okay, that $5,000, but what can we compare that to? Uh, in 1968, and these are the numbers I got from, uh, from the web, um, the new house was $15,000, one five. So three times that. Three calculator like that, you had a new house. The average, of course, I'm not talking about mansions or anything, but an average new house was $15,000. And an average income a year for somebody was $7,800, so almost half of the price of the house. So a little bit less than two of these a year. So just to compare, you know, the price of this, and uh, one thing that you can understand right now is this was not in every house. This wasn't um, a computer that you would have. It's not like the uh, IBM PC that was designed to be in every house. This one was reserved for companies, for research, for universities who had a lot of money and who could uh, afford to buy such a a big calculator. So let's have a look at the details on this calculator and see um, what we can see. Um, first, the display. Uh, don't look too much because this one has a little problem. The display is too compact. Uh, we can still read the numbers, but I need to adjust something somewhere. And I didn't want to spend too much time or play too much with the board inside. But the display is a small TV. It's a CRT, the, a cathode ray tube. And this is not unusual for calculators at that uh, period of time to have a small TV as a display because they knew how to use a TV and uh, if you can display a picture on the TV, you can display numbers. So no problem, they, they were using that for calculators. Now the keyboard, you will see a bunch of functions here that you wouldn't find in uh, other regular calculators. Sine, cosine, ten, uh, tangent, hyper, arc, polar, and then you can see numbers, so alphanumeric. And then you can see on the right here some programming instruction. So yes, this was a programmable computer. You could enter your program in here and you can run them and do some research on this computer. 1968, a desktop computer that was one of the first programmable computer that where you could uh, you could do all of this. And um, all of this 
And I really want to say that this is a lot of function. This is a lot of power that you have. All of this was, do, was done using only discrete components. So let me show you. So to show you, I took the camera in my hand. So excuse me if there is some shaking. Um, just another view of the keyboard. On the right here, you have the number of uh, decimal points that you can do. And here you have program or run so you can understand that it was a programmable computer and there is something else here that I want to show you uh, there is a small slot here on the top I don't know if you can see it right here and this slot was used with magnetic cards so here's an example of a magnetic card and using this card you could put the card here and read or write your program. So not only you can program, but you can save that on the memory in a small card like this. So this is, I mean, you cannot save megabyte, of course, but at least you could save the, the few lines of your programs that you wrote and uh, do not uh, lose them. So now, you, you understand this is a programmable computer with all the scientific functions. How does it work? Well, look inside. So you can see here's the CRT, the tube. That's the power supply. And right here we have some boards, but on all these boards there's not one integrated chip. Everything is discrete component like transistors, resistors, condenser, not one chip here. And look at the look at the main ball here. It's just a collection of diodes and resistors. So imagine all of this to write program, to store programs to execute all those scientific functions. Just discrete components. I, I'm, I'm really amazed at that because it's so easy to use um, an, an integrated circuit on an IC, but when you think about the difficulty of using all those discrete components at that time, that was amazing. Here's a core memory. Top. Anyway, amazing. And the, um, also, they had a very good design. I mean, this machine is very easy to service. You see, I had just to raise the top here. And there is a lock here to hold it in place. And let me close it. Oops. There you go. And I'm ready to work. So again, amazing machine, 1968. And uh, uh, let me tell you something else about that. So I'm going to put back the camera. Yeah. So what? Yeah. The, the, there was also an option. If you can see here on the top, there's two small. Uh, openings. There was an option where you could put the printer. There was a specific printer that you can put on top here and that was connected to the back of the machine. This slot here where there was a, a specific input output card and you could send everything on the printer. So now what I wanted to show you is when I bought this machine here there was an engraving on top here and if you can see M. E. Fisher, Baker Lab, Cornell University. And I was curious because I said it could be a student, but um, first, it's a very well-known university. Cornell University is a very well-known one. And then I look, I look up the name M. E. Fisher. And I found the person, and uh, it's, uh, it's somebody who did a lot of research on theoretical numbers, and I, I was trying to read the, the, what, he, what he discovered, and I couldn't really understand. But 
it's kind of too high level for me but think about it this one was used by a researcher in Cornell University in 1968 and uh, I found this guy on the web and uh, I'll put a small description of it in the video and he was so lucky to use this machine to do all the programming and work on the, I think it was working on either prime number or um, some specific other numbers. I'll, I'll find the details for you. So again, um, HP 9100 from 1968, a very powerful machine. And uh, if you can get one, try to get one because there's not too many of them left working. So thanks again for watching my video. I'm gonna put the, the cover on this one. And uh, until next time, I'll talk about something completely different and uh, as I said maybe this one uh, I like it because it's so big <laughs> and very cumbersome but anyway thank you and see you next time